Nice. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, something I wrote in the in, in the what do you call it the description to this is that I have done exactly zero <laughs> preparation for this because I wanted to talk about something at weeklies, but I've been incredibly tired because you know everything. So I thought, okay, let's uh, let's talk about user styles because that's something that I accidentally stumbled upon some months ago, and I think it's fun. Uh, also, maybe man many years ago, a coworker had joked that they would listen to me just read out CSS rules. So that's what we're gonna do, and uh, you're stuck here. Sorry, uh, <laughs> no, but it's all good. Um, so uh, first of all, what are we writing user styles for? What, what are user styles? Uh, let me preface that. Uh, it used to be the case that you could add uh, styles in a browser as a user. Those are called user styles. So in the regular CSS cascade, you had browser styles, then you had user styles, then you had site or author styles. Or author intent or whatever that was called. Most browsers, actually all browsers, removed that feature to have user styles. So the only way to get user styles nowadays is through some kind of browser extension that literally injects CSS as a user. I understand why they did that, because it's one extra layer of, well, cascade or even specificity to, to fight against as a as an author. But also as a user, I, I kind of don't like it because I think it's one of the best parts of the web is being able to poke around. Like the fact that I can be here and like open the inspector is pretty damn amazing in my opinion. And yeah, you can go and start like writing styles like background red, important or something like that. Uh, beautiful. But uh, you know that's not going to get saved. Um, but with some kind of uh, browser extension, one of which is Stylus and another one is Xstyle, you can go and uh, start adding them back. Yay. Uh, there used to be another one called Stylus, which apparently was malware <laughs> that was stealing all of your uh, browsing uh, activity. So that was not good. Or it was doing something malicious anyway. I don't, I don't remember. Uh, and that's kind of the problem with having to trust. Browser extension with this is that if I can, you know, as a malicious actor, go and hack into the Stylus repository, uh, I can get some pretty good data from users, uh, which is uh, interesting. Anyway, but why would you want to write user styles? I can tell you why I would want to write user styles, which is to add focus styles back in. So focus indicators, uh, if you don't know them, they're these uh, rectangles that appear over links, buttons, uh, inputs, interactive elements uh, on a website. Currently on my screen, it's as a white rectangle with a little bit of a border radius on top of the word Firefox, then Chrome, Opera, and so on, because those are links. Uh, browsers provide these focus styles by default. However, what ends up happening quite often is that developers will go and do something like, you know, all links outline none important. And just to be sure, outline zero important, even though that's not, oh, is that valid? Yes. And then they might add it some more times just to be extra sure that there are no focus styles. Uh, of course, I'm being a little bit uh, playful with this, but many websites remove focus styles. And that can happen for a thousand different reasons. One very common one is that it was added at some point years ago in your style sheet somewhere, and it has remained there. And nobody has either noticed, or what's more likely, somebody has noticed, they tried to change it, it wasn't looking visually the same anymore because, well, the site didn't have focus styles before. Their boss told them that, you know, they're ruining everything and they should go back to work or something. And yeah, and life sucks sometimes. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I really like, for so often I look at a site that doesn't have outlines that first I get a little bit annoyed because I use the keyboard a lot is the is the subtext here. And I rely on focus styles to, to be able to work. But also I, I then go to the second stage of, of grief, which is that, oh yeah, probably somebody did try to fix it. And just the organizational historical friction was too big. Anyway, but you can add them back with user styles. And I think as an exercise, I think it's really interesting because once you have a thousand different rules on a website, uh, actually having to go and like slice them open and figure out, okay, this element gets a focus style. Oh wait, this link is used as a button. So maybe it doesn't need the focus style. It's quite a good exercise to, to, to learn CSS or to, I don't know, have fun on a Saturday afternoon. I don't know, other people go bouldering but, or something, but. Hey, you know, making focus styles is good. So I have an example here. That was something I worked on uh, a month ago. Uh, I've been using Duolingo, uh, not not to learn Greek, as you have in this example here, uh, to learn Finnish. But I'm not going to have my regular profile up here for fear of being humiliated. No, that's not true. 
but uh, I wanted to have some fun with it. Um, like I even named the user FP the adversary just to to test all of the focus styles. And uh, right now I'm pressing the tab key on my keyboard. I'm trying to go through parts of this page. Something is in focus because you can see that the page moves. So if the page moves, it moves when something changes focus usually. But uh, yeah, there's no focus indicator whatsoever there. So I don't know if I press enter, something's gonna happen. Oh, we were here. Okay, that's good. So maybe now we're, oh, we're there, not in the model. Okay, um, that's kind of annoying. So why does this happen? Again, a good guess here is that if we go and inspect the styles, again, I know it's a little bit tight on the space here, but we'll, we'll manage. So we might link for, we'll look for a link or a button. In this case, it's neither. It's a div with a tab index of zero, which means that it will be in the tab order. Uh, and again, I think this is a fun exercise to see just how does code look like on websites that exist out there. I think, I don't know, again, that's one of the best parts about web development in my experiences. You can go and inspect and see things. And yeah, okay, I might be like, haha, tab index zero, blah, 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 whatever. It doesn't matter. That's not the point. I'm, I'm often really playful about these things, but I, I try to be very clear that I understand how all of these things happen. And I think that's another good exercise in empathy is when you see this is, okay, Maybe my first thing is to giggle a little bit, but then I, I can think of all the thousand ways that somebody tried to do the right thing here. So this thing here, if we toggle the focus styles, we would expect to see something in focus, but uh, we don't see anything. And in fact, we see a very, um, with a universal selector, this star, we see outline none, which is the telltale sign that you know somebody has disabled the focus styles. You can even dive, dive into the CSS, you could format it, and see that pretty high up in the CSS, like line 180 of what I assume is like thousands of, yeah, 10,000 lines, 180, very high up in our priority is our, is removing the focus styles. And you might see it at many parts in the cascade that it the focus styles keep getting reset just in case, basically. There's other modern ways, by the way, of, of hiding or only showing focus styles for what you perceive to be keyboard modalities. It's much more than keyboard, by the way. It might be sequential navigation. It might be a switch device. It might be touch interfaces with uh, a keyboard uh, attached either via Bluetooth or via screen reader emulation. So there's many ways that why you would need focus styles, actually. And that's also why removing them as a blanket rule or trying to add them very bespokely in user land tends to trip over itself. If you want to read about this, I have written about it, something like this, yes. Progressively enhancing focus visible. You can go and uh, I'll link that in the notes later. But there are good modern ways that you can hide the focus styles if you don't want them as a pointer device user. Thank you, Yuhis, and, and manage. Anyway, okay, so we want to add these focus styles back in nonetheless. Uh, the way we're going to do it is we're going to write some focus styles. So in this case, I have written some focus styles, which I can show you here. They are also available as exist. And when you click on this link, if you have stylus enabled, it actually detects the fact that it's a user style and you can install it. So if I show you real quick, if I activate the focus styles, suddenly we have focus indicators. And not only do we have focus indicators, I try to make them pretty. So they have some kind of border radius that matches the visual design of the site, et cetera. Why? Because I don't know, I like things being pretty as well, okay? Like I want them being usable and you can make them pretty, don't worry. Uh, well, <laughs> you're probably not worried. I'm sure somebody else is like doing the worrying for you usually. I know I'm prefacing the things I'm saying quite a lot, but it's been a goddamn year and like my anxiety is through the roof. So I feel like I need to specify everything really well. If that gets annoying, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have focus styles. And then if you uh, press enter to activate this, again, you want to know where the focus is because a dialogue opens. This dialogue is not modal, which means that I can interact with the rest of the page as well. So it's quite important once I activate it to know what I am so I can start the lesson, for example. Okay, what do you hear? I don't know what I hear, to be honest. This, oh. fine. Well, who knows? Uh, and same thing here, you have some focus styles. What you might notice is that while I'm tabbing, I'm not actually focused on these four elements. And that's because they don't have, they're not buttons, they're not in the tab order. There is nothing really that I can do with CSS to make these operable by keyboard. They're still operable actually because you can use the numbers on your keyboard. So as a sighted keyboard user, I can operate the site. You wouldn't be able to do it necessarily as a blind uh, keyboard user. But anyway, that's uh, specific things. Uh, and also I like the focus styles personally, especially on Duolingo because 
I want to know what I'm interacting with. I tend to get lost on pages myself. Like that's why I tend to browse at high zoom levels and so on. So actually the focus styles help me know where I am on the page. There's other things that you can fix with focus style. So another common way that websites um, don't do well for accessibility is zoom levels. So this is my demo zoom level. My regular zoom level is something like this, 175, 200 sometimes. Um, now at 200%, uh, this top bar is sticky. This bottom bar is sticky. This barbell icon is sticky, and then this advertisement plus thing is sticky. So actually, there's a really small area with which I can interact on the site. There's basically enough for a single skill. If a dialogue opens, uh, you know, oh. it's not great. And this happens on many sites, by the way, like sticky headers and footer, or not footers, because sticky footer is a different thing. Sticky headers are really common. And what I generally recommend with sticky headers is that you only make them sticky if you have enough uh, screen height. Uh, you can do that with the CSS media query. So if I open the focus styles, uh, sorry, the, the custom styles again, you can see that I make them static at the top of the page and I can keep browsing. Uh, this barbell becomes smaller and then this giant thing is still pretty big because they just added it a few days ago. And that's the pain of, of user styles. Uh, you play whack-a-mole with the developers. Uh, sometimes you play doubly whack-a-mole with the developers because uh, most sites still tend to use class names and you know have decent semantic selectors. Many other modern sites, Duolingo in particular, they use CSS and JS, which is to say that uh, you write the styles in JavaScript usually, and then their the, the properties are typically sorted and the content of that is hashed. So basically, if I have a combination of display block with height 50 pixels with 50 pixels, there is some kind of hashing function that will call this, you know, dot underscore 11 slash MR, uh, dash MR. And any element that has these styles usually has the same, the same class, but maybe I'm wrong in this case, let's see. Okay, we can take another example, right? Like a list item class equals three RI two Q which is every basically navigation element. Uh, you see that they have the same style between them, but it's completely meaningless as a user, as, a, as an author. And it's meaningless and it's kind of uh, hard because you shouldn't, you cannot rely on this name to stay the same. Like if anything in those properties change, then the elements themselves are going to change. Sometimes people will have these data attributes like data test, home nav, which is really good if you wanna target styles. So if writing user styles is a good exercise, I think writing user styles to target a site that has CSS and JS is like the final boss. And I haven't shown you CSS yet. I'm gonna show you the CSS now. It's really fun. So we can go to the gist again. Let's see. So, oh, by the way, you can also edit these things uh, sort of in line. So if you open the stylus editor, you have your things here. Oh, maybe we can, so, which styles do I like more? Ah, uh, this is better. I like this more. So, okay, how, what do you do with user styles? So first of all, okay, we want to add some focus styles. We want to do buttons, anything with a tab index. Uh, so any custom element basically that is keyboard, well, not operable, but reachable by keyboard. In this case, very specifically, these uh, exercise icons are tab index zero. Any inputs, any text areas, any links with a uh, hyper, whatever, href element, select details, basically anything I could think of that is interactable. There's many more elements, but those are the ones that I could find on the site. And you're gonna do something really simple, which is you want to add some focus indicator. A, oh, by the way, something that I think is important when you, when I write CSS in general, but especially when you write user styles, uh, there's about a one-to-one -one comment to code ratio or perhaps even higher because you know one of these things is going to break. You just know it's going to happen. It's inevitable. So you want to add comments to explain what the hell is happening. Also, I like having comments here because some, again, random person on the internet might find this and want to customize it. And I think it's kind of nice if they know what is happening. Um, so uh, in this case, we want to do something really nice, which is uh, if you use a browser outline, uh, it will not follow borders. So if you have a border here, it's gonna be square, like a rectangular uh, with a right angle. But uh, if you wanna add the border radius, you cannot do it with an outline. The way you would do it would be with a box shadow because the box shadows will follow outlines. So you can add a box shadow with some custom uh, width and color. These are uh, CSS custom properties. And what's super cool about user styles is that you can de define 
these as a first class sort of citizen. So you can say that the user can customize this, the user can customize that. And then when it comes time to install it somewhere, I don't even remember where anymore. Mm, what if I, yes. So no, that's not true. What am I forgetting? I was just explaining that you can actually edit this without editing the text with a UI, but I don't remember what it is. Anyway, I'm gonna skip that demo effect, it's okay. So you can do all of these. Now we get to even more fan things. For example, we can refine these. So some of the buttons, uh, in particular these pop-ups, their borders are not actually their borders, but they're on a pseudo element. <laughs> and because they're on a pseudo element, you have to target the pseudo element or no? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So again, Here's three lines to explain what's happening. Then you have to go and say, OK, for these skill pop-outs, and I'm so happy they have a data attribute here. Uh, if you are using CSS and JS, my recommendation would be try to expose this at least in some important parts of your application, because it's nice if the user can customize them. Also, you're probably going to need them for testing. That's why they're called data tests. They didn't do this because they wanted me to customize things or anything. So you hide the box add from the button, and you add the box add to like data skill pop out, button, focus, after. Mm, beautiful. By the way, again, in CSS, you can target custom attributes with these like uh, square brackets. So if you do data test equals skills pop out, that's the equivalent of targeting Again, this thing here, data test skill pop out, which is quite nice. Uh, and yeah, that means that in principle, you could even do square brackets dot class name and you will target a class without needing. But I don't know why you would do that, to be honest. You, mm, well, there might be some fun uses for that. Anyway, so some more things. Uh, the skills that are unavailable, so the ones that are past your default checkpoints, so here, they have pretty bad color contrast. They have this gray thing. Uh, and I want to be able to see them because I want to know what's happening next. So you want to target these. And now the way we target this is the following. You have a data test of skill. And then inside of it, you have something with a tab index equals 0. And then inside of that, you have a div. And then you can use that a good color. That works quite OK, actually. This has not been very bad. There is another uh, truly cursed way of doing it, which is you could do data test is a tree section, and then a general sibling of that is not a tree section. And inside of that, you have a data test of skill. So let me translate that, what happens on the page. This is a skill section. This is not a, sk a skill section. So this is a skill section that you haven't unlocked, basically. So in theory, you could say that, yeah, the next sibling of that, the items inside of it are also skills you don't, you haven't studied or you don't have access to. You could do that. I put that in a comment if you really wanted to. But I think this is a little bit nicer. Now, navigation links, same thing. If there was a navigation region, it would be really nice. In this case, there isn't. So we say, OK, list items, et cetera. And then you have even more cursed things. So the pop-out for checkpoints is either a bright yellow or a hot purple, is what I'm writing. I forgot about this. And they don't have really good contrast. So if I am here, now the contrast is good. If I turn off the focus status, is this yellow and orange, which doesn't do it for me. And these are all siblings. So the way you target this is that it is a sibling of a tree section that is not a tree section in and of itself, that inside of it has a pop-up of a style of Z index one, and inside of that has a div or a button, because the button also says the color. So, and again, these are a bit cursed, but I love it. Like, how cool is it that I can go into, <laughs> into a page and, and do this really cursed thing that you don't want to do? By the way, here's a, here's a good use case for uh, the attribute selector, is that I want to target something that has the inline style of Z index equals one, which usually means it's a pop-up. So yeah, so it's the sibling of a, what was it? The sibling of a tree section that is not itself a tree section and any pop-up inside of it, the text and the buttons. Beautiful. Yeah, you can see here Z index equals one. And then you can actually inspect your user styles, which is really cool. So here's the user style, our, our little like uh, monstrosity over here. You can read this. There's even more fun things. So if you want to target the navigation, you can do things like the root, and then the first child, and then the first child, and then the first child, and then the second child. That's like the top bar. Actually, while I was preparing, preparing, while I was booting this up to check that nothing was breaking for this talk, uh, this was broken. So I had to add one more level of divs here to fix it because the developers uh, added one layer of divs so they can position them in the same context, which is quite fun. And another really cool thing is that this top navigation, when I want to make it static, which is the initial property for position, by the way, that's static. Because I wanted to position it static, it has a menu inside of it. So if I if I were to do just the static thing, 
and open this menu, suddenly this menu breaks because it relies on the positioning context. So actually, I have to make it relative so that the menu positions itself correctly. And of course, because I'm not, I'm not going to remember at all, I have to leave a comment and say, yeah, add this relative instead of starting to all the pop out. I think this is really fun. Uh, other things like the barbell icon that I showed you that gets in the way, there's no good way to make this static because it's actually nested in something that is positioned and you cannot select a parent based on its children. So you cannot say the parent that inside of it has the barbell icon go and position it statically. So the best I can do in user styles is to go and just make it smaller. So, okay, it's going to be in my face. Yeah, exactly. All of you need some uh, grease monkey or some custom scripting to go in there and do those selectors. Uh, that might be another talk, actually, if I really want to. Uh, and there is a long history, by the way, of assistive technology users writing custom scripts and styles to fix things for themselves. Like this is not new in any way. And this is by far the simplest use case. Like I am a sighted user that wants to use the keyboard and like I tend to lose focus. So I like focus indicators. But yeah, I don't know. This has been a really fun thing that I've been working on. I have a few more gists for the other sites, some of which are actually our clients. So I'm not going to be showing them to you now. But suffice it to say, it's something that I think is quite cool. Oh, one thing I will say with all of these, or at least the ones that are I have public, I go ahead and I don't make them MIT licensed. Like people cannot use this for commercial purposes because if Duolingo or any other like company wants to make things accessible, they should go and pay people to do that. Uh, like I think in general, I've gotten pretty annoyed with companies asking me or especially other people to do accessibility work for them for free. Uh, so any user can use this basically if they want to make this more accessible to them, but Duolingo maybe should pay or something like that, or they should prioritize it. It's really hard. I say pay, but there's obviously people who want to do this in Duolingo. I don't believe that any site you know, has people who don't care about accessibility, but if it's not on the roadmap, what are you going to do? Work two jobs within your day job? Anyway, that's where my mind that has been in this pandemic, if you're wondering. <laughs> yeah. This is my very uh, ad hoc uh, presentation. I can paste this real quick in the chat because I will otherwise forget because that's me. And yeah, if this is interesting, hit me up on Slack or somewhere and uh, let's uh, write some CSS. And again, I think it's a really fun way to, to learn or practice CSS if you're interested in this. That's my talk. Awesome. Thank you so much for this. That was amazing. I hope you can also share the links in Slack. Mm -hmm. the thread because the chat is less yeah, yeah. Thank you for this. <laughs>